inviting to it. My name is Lindy Nebenekoka. Um, I'm on the board of SWIFT, Sisters Working in Film and Television, and I'm currently an acting executive officer. Um, me, I've got my paper, but I've got a powerhouse. So I don't want to, I don't want to miss anything. Uh, I'm going to ask my panel members to speak 30 seconds to introduce themselves. So, have a, hello everybody, my name is Bobby Johar. I am from the company that you can work group. Originally, I am yeah, the global managing director of the company. And originally, I, was, I am from India, but I was born and raised in Denmark. My mother uh, was born and raised in Uganda. Uh, and now I work for an American company that wants to be very local and established here in Africa. So it's like I'm in full circle. It's the first time for me being here, and I'm in awe. I'm thrilled, uh, and I'm I'm like a little kid. I feel at home. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Siko Maya. Uh, yeah, I'm a television. Uh, Expert at the industry, I've been part of the industry for years now. I've been working for South Africa's biggest TV distribution But I am today here on the capacity of Showmax and I'm looking forward to the conversation of the body. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jite O'Brien. Uh, I work with Accelerate TV, an uh, entertainment platform based out of Lagos, Nigeria. Um, and we launched our own app service about a year and a half ago. Um, and yeah, I want to let the world know that they can watch the best African content on Accelerate Plus. So, go download the app. <coughs> So I've done lots of production over the years and um, currently my role is Jewel and um, then I work for Jewel Distribution, which is a boutique distribution sales company here in Africa. And also we are looking after Mandela Bay Pictures where we're trying to have a few scripted and unscripted properties and um, yeah, it's basically me. Uh, oh, you're me? There we go. Uh, so my name is Hedora uh, Kobari. My name is Monia Twala. Um, I've had the great privilege of, uh, of uh, working on a diverse sphere in terms of uh, the industry uh, across free to air pay TV, and it continues to grow uh, into new spaces. Uh, I'm with uh, Paramount Global um, and um, as the co GM and senior vice president for our Africa business. Uh, we are, yes, here in Africa. We've got our offices in Bryanston. Um, and we also have an office in Lagos. Uh, those are key, uh, key, uh, two key markets. Um, I also head up meet international markets across South Africa, France, uh, the UK, and, uh, and Brazil. Great to meet you. Great. So, this is very serendipitous for me because in my previous life, I was with government and I was responsible for the development of the film industry. So the next chapter, the next chapter of film and TV in Africa, given the rapid advancement of technology. My first question to all of you is, how would you define African content? It starts with simple. <laughs> I'm the guest. <laughs> 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 
All right. What are the factors that make African content? Well, I mean, for me, it's 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 it's, it's a two-pronged question, right? So. It, it goes both on a content level and also on a business level. So I would say on a, on a business level, look, um, the organization that I work for, we pride ourselves in producing, you know, original African content, right? That has been uh, a key stra strategy in, in how we roll out the, and produce the type of content that we produce. And on a content level, what we do is we don't just go and um, dub content and say that we're producing African content. Yes, dub, dubbing is definitely one of the key elements in terms of you know uh, making sure that you have relevance across the continent. But for us, it goes operationally, right? So in all the territories in which we produce content in, we first ensure, ensure that we go by employing uh, people who work in that region, right? To tell the story of the people who live in that region and ensure that also from a cultural relevance point of view, language point of view that it resonates with the people in that um, in that region and then hopefully that will then translate into uh, the, the producing content that will then reflect a story that, that all Africans can understand on the continent and, and abroad. Um, and from an operations point of view, again, uh, we ensure that you continue to invest in Africans, right? Uh, and that's the only way that we can ensure that we are telling true African stories um, in, 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 in the region. Yeah, I would like to say it's very similar, similar mindset for us. Um, as a Nigeria-based business, we know that there's um, a lot of talent in Africa. Um, there's lots of people that have lots of amazing stories to tell. So the way that we see it is any content that's made by Africans for Africans is great content. You make it very difficult for me. <laughs> Uh, I guess for me, like I have a, a I guess like a, a more um, um, torn definition of what African content is because there is, as a uh, producer and also like a filmmaker, the, uh, this uh, this is a, a, a label that has weight in its way because it means that you might be you might see that you're going to be cornered into like just like a, a, a sweet thing. It's <laughs> It might make um, it might get you cornered into just a specific market when you really are. I think that African um, uh, content makers are just content makers. What they want to do is just they want to make content, and then they want to, of course, they want that their content to meet the, an audience. So, uh, I guess for me, so on on the negative side, that would be that like not being, um, uh, I guess, like restricted to. One, one specific like specific festival, specific, specific market. And then on the other hand, for me, it's also you know, what you guys mentioned, the, the, the fact that the content is created by someone from Africa and also that the IP is, is uh, uh, owned by someone from Africa and that those people actually benefit from you know, the, their creation. Um, yeah, so I do agree regarding what, what Siko said, you know, but I think over and above that, for me, when I think about African content, I really think about representation, both in front and behind the camera. I think um, we had somebody previously ask me a question about the kind of talent that we are ready to kind of take in and the kind of content that we, the talent we're willing to work with as producers in Africa. And I think representation for me means that it's, it's African content, it's African IP, it's African story, but it's told by Africans. And we're not there yet, I don't think. And I think that's a big conversation to open up really about representation. If it resonates with Africans or people from the diaspora, um, but also who's making it is really important and who's benefiting from it is really important. Um, I think from my perspective, I'll, I'll, I'll take a slight twist. Sorry. Uh, that's what I do. Um, I think uh, this African content is anchored around, I think, um, storytelling. I think it's, 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 it's the line we always kind of uh, gravitate towards. I think Africans have a different story to tell. Um, that storytelling is anchored in great magic, great energy um, that is that is really built on authenticity. Um, and I think it's it's really anchored African content, especially going forward, should be seen as content because um, we also need to be telling those stories for a global market. Um, we, you know, if you look at our business at Paramount, we, you know, we're a global business. Um, you know, the African business is very important to us, uh, hence we are anchored in South Africa and 
and in Lagos, and we continue to, to find partnerships across the continent, be it in Kenya and other markets, um, speaking to a colleague now from Namibia, we see what we can do there. But, but you know, we, we are really anchored in how we can create that bridge where we can tell African stories for a global audience so that it's not that made reference to as what is African content and how we just know what it's content told from an African uh, perspective. And, and I think that's where that was anchors us uh, from a parliament uh, perspective. It's content for Africans, by Africans, for the world. Yeah. Content for the youth, you know, by the youth. For the world, yeah, uh, that's that's really it. So, so, so great. I mean, I mean, just take it from there, Monday. What then gives it a global appeal? What are the factors in that that gives it a global appeal? So, yeah, one day you work for a global company, so you would know the ins and outs. Many of you have a lot of experience with content production applications. I represent a service company and a software company that helps the likes of Netflix. Amazon, um, Apple, this world, streamline, manage the content, and globalize it uh, as a service provider. And the, the thing about what makes something distinct and yet scalable is exactly what you're talking about. Monday. It's about storytelling, but it's also about having this distinct sneak peek into that subtle culture of this. You know, we are guests, we're visiting your home, we're getting in slightly tweak insight into the love story, what that may look like in Scandinavia, what that may look like in the US, what that may look like in Africa. And in Africa, Africa is not just Africa, Africa is so many different countries with so many different cultural differences, and yet it needs to have a relatable appeal. And if it's not relatable, it's not scalable. And I think taking what is what in this context what we're talking about now and in the future. I came here because I wanted to help take Africa, the content industry, into that future. I wanted to be that assistant. And part of that has to be relatable. It has to transcend borders. Um, and that comes from good storytelling uh, with universal uh, relatable topics as drama and love and, and, and the things that we can all, you know, look, we are looking our own, looking at ourselves and relate to. So, so let's let's examine the impact of, of, of the digital platforms, the pro proliferation of, of streaming services, and its impact on on the process of of creation, of production, of distribution. I mean, the whole value chain in the industry. What what is the impact? Sure, uh, it's, a, it's part of a loaded question. That one. Um, so, I mean, I want to tackle it from my perspective, our perspective as a business, right? Is what we're trying to do, you know, create something that's sustainable for, for our communities. So, we, we look at obviously the one thing that connects all of us, which is the content, right? And, and then, uh, then, then layer it down to and say, from what we take out into the industry, how does this benefit everyone else? Because at the end of the day, it's about you know, creating employment for people. It's about protecting actors' rights, protecting people's rights and our rights, right? So we first have to ensure that whatever whatever we produce or whatever, whatever we put on air is, is something that, that's scalable, right? And, 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 and making sure that we, we really focus on growing the industry wherever we, we, wherever our touch points are. So for instance, in Nigeria and Kenya, which are two of our uh, next big key, key focuses for Showmax, we have ensured that we have put in the right uh, resources, whether it be human resources, human capital, human capital, financial resources to grow the industry within Nigeria, um, to ensure that you know we we are able to, to create uh, longevity for the industry in those in those markets. But then, open about that, I mean, our platform is still new, right? So we, we are also in a on a learning curve of what the future for the OTT or as what the uh, platform looks like on the continent, we do realize that we have a lot of competition that has come into our own space. So we obviously are naive in, in terms of how much level of investment is required for us to be competitive, right? Um, as it is, we are still transcending. We've got a, a great partnership that we just started now with this Universal's podcast, which is now going to allow us to be able to create a platform 
that, that is compensable on that scale. Excuse me, that is compensable on that scale, but at the same time, create something that the consumer can also enjoy. You know, we're talking about you know consumer experience, that journey. What what does it look like when you log on there? And at the same time, ensuring that uh, we 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 make people proud of the of the platform that they jump on, onto. Right. The other day, I was uh, just going on social trends. I think I was on, 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 on Twitter or X, as it, as it is called now. And there's been so many great stories that have come out of the news. And the one thing that I saw, and I don't know if this is something that is only true to South Africans, but South Africans really, I, I don't mean to derail the conversation, but they are not proud of things that are produced by South Africans. And I don't know why that is, right? They take a lot of, a lot of uh, 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 confidence in something that is international, Right, so I think our job now, as 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 multi choice as Showmax, is to ensure that we bring back pride in in every uh, product and service that we develop for our people. Because without that, <coughs> employment will be stifled. Yeah. You know, the industry itself will be stifled yeah. in terms of growth, um, etc. So, so, so I want to touch on on the opportunities the ch- and the challenges that you experience given you know, the pro- proliferation of the streaming services, just one day few. So, I mean, I, I think I, I'll just take a slight step back because I think for me, just answering that question, you know, the impact of technology in our ecosystem, uh, particularly as a continent, I think is, is immerse, it's immersed, it's an amazing opportunity. Um, I think it creates more diversity, which we need. Uh, this diversity of voices, uh, diversity of producers, different perspectives of what is the best that could be of African content. Uh, I think it enables us to, you know, align with where consumers are. You know, consumers are, 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 look, are watching content on multiple devices. It's, 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 it's multi, you know, territory. It's multi-platform, uh, but also it enables us then to really monetize and, 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 and you know amongst the investments that you all are making into creative content. Uh, but also I think in this new world it's a great partnership. You know uh, you know we, we, you know at Paramount we've done partnerships with showmans, we've done partnerships with Netflix, we've done partnerships with everybody because okay, it's, you get that it's what it's <laughs> it's what it's, it's, it's really you know we, we're open for business but it's enabled by technology if you look at uh, the, the what also the big impact for me is is, is the economics yes. the, and, the, and, the, and the economic impact that technology is having is in, in, in terms of what it's enabling it's enabling yes our industry is growing we have more storytellers more voices uh, more competition it's healthy for our industry uh, but also, for me, the true beneficiary, the true winner is the African people. Yeah. You know, because they don't have, you know, uh, deep pockets for subscriptions sometimes. So, if you look at, if you look internationally in markets like uh, South America, you look at India, uh, you look at, even in the US, Europe, fast services are, are launching, you know, because it's, there's, there's, there's a great need for access. I always say, Africans do not, I really know this land, I've used this land all my life. Africans do not watch content for entertainment. It's, it's infotainment, it's exposure, it's information, it's how we travel the world. I first traveled the world, I've been everywhere in the world, but I first traveled the world through a show on Lala's platform on SCDC in the 80s called The Big World. I traveled the world. And it probably influenced the way I am today because I was like, I want to be everywhere. I want to do a backpacking show with Isaac Chaw. Remember? You know, I'm telling you, it, it made a whole lot of young South Africans dream and think about what's possible. That's the impact. So, so you've taken all the questions because I was about to ask about actors. Like, no, please. <laughs> By the way, I like the fact that. Reference India, you pointed at me. I was. <laughs> I told you I was born in Copenhagen. You did. I, <laughs> no, you did. You did. You did. I, I arrived in Los Angeles. The guy is sitting there. He says, "Hey, man, where are you from?" I say, hey, I'm from Copenhagen, Denmark. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> I can't win. 
No, opportunities and challenges from a service provider perspective. I just want to take that to the Again, we don't know who's sitting here. There's a huge industry that I've been uh, attending you know, this week, uh, from production companies, from distribution companies, uh, platforms. Everybody is, is looking at how they can bring content to market. And technology is an enabler. Uh, and it makes it affordable. And yet, you don't want to compromise quality because the bar is racing. And Africa wants to set a standard not only in storytelling but also in globalization. Meaning bringing that story not just across the African continent but also let us enjoy the story as another Bollywood story or as a Danish crime uh, or a drama series called uh, the crime series called Born or what have you, Squid Games. <laughs> so part of that is organizing. If you want to be digital, you've got to start organizing and look at your content as money, as assets. And part of that is managing your business, managing your story, not just telling your story. And so what Blue has been all about is finding ways to not just talk about globalization, but use software in a very distinct way to help the industries of various stages of the life cycle to produce simpler, better, uh, and at scale without compromising quality. Because here comes the paramount of this world. Here comes the showmax of this world. And they're setting the bar differently. And so the stories I've heard, whether it's uh, a beautiful woman called Mimi from uh, top of the line in Nollywood, they are all struggling with how can you raise the bar. So technology is about making things affordable. It's about making things simpler. And it's also about having a very, very critical eye on quality because that is the only thing that the industry will not compromise on. So I just wanted to really um, also, because I think that question you asked about what the proliferation of these sort of platforms means for us, I think it, it's a dual thing in terms of producers. If I put myself back where I was a year ago, producing all of a sudden, it's, there's, there's diverse, diversification, the English is about to leave. Um, so it's a diverse uh, um, platform, a uh, channel that you can move all of a sudden there's different people that you can partner with and collaborate with. The tech of it is really interesting as well one day because you know, we used to look at ratings, that was like the biggest thing now. But if you're doing a show for an OTT, you know when your movie has hit number one. You know when your movie has hit its targets as a producer. And I think it, it gives us kind of like additional ways to, to check how our work is doing. And I think that's great. Um, but yeah, dem democratization is what technology has done and give people access, yeah. way more access to young filmmakers and producers. And that's great. It's what we're looking for. the same thing on both sides. So it's given the producers, the filmmakers, multiple places that they can put their content. And then it's also given the audience multiple choices, multiple right. places you can go to. So you can go to this platform and watch this, and you can also go to that platform and watch something else. But the producers can also benefit by having their content on both platforms, or they can do an exclusive deal for this platform. So I think technology has just pretty much opened up the world for everybody. And um, it's fantastic because you have these young people who don't, They've created stuff on YouTube and they've made their first film and they don't know where to go and it's not like you can just go on the internet and it says this is how to make money from film, no. <laughs> so I mean, places like this, a lot of people can and sit down and how do you make film? How do I go from the documentary to this or how do I go from the stage play? And technology has facilitated availability of all this information and all the different places that people can uh, benefit from. Yeah, I hear that sounds very perfect. <laughs> I mean, what is it done to the competitive space amongst the businesses? For me, what, the way we see that accelerate is the sky is enough for everybody. Um, it's, it's nice to say, but obviously there's still competition. People are looking at, oh, well, Netflix is doing this. Why is it, Why are you doing this? Or, oh, you're doing this, you want to compete with Netflix? Not really. I mean, Netflix is a, a huge platform. It has great, great content. But there's only so much African content that they can put on their platform. So all the people that can't get on Netflix or can't get on Amazon, where can they go? Accelerate. <laughs> so um, <laughs> that's the thing, that's the point, why it's good to have multiple options. So you can show the people that have the multi-million budget film, and you can also show the people that were working together in university and made a, an interesting and amazing film on their iPhone. So yeah, I think it's, I think it's great.
I, I, absolutely, I, I agree. I think there's like absolutely room for everybody because I think that uh, you know the technology, not necessarily the technology, is not available everywhere. Like if I think about like uh, Francophone Africa, I'm very excited to see that now we moved on from a, a very like art like. Uh, cultural like festival like, kind of model to a more business like model and that this is because you know people are able to access uh, technology and then put their content on uh, YouTube and you know uh, make money of it and then like, make like, millions of views and be able to you know see who's, who sees their content and just tailor to it and then uh, yeah so it's uh, and I think that now that gives them also like a, um, a better um, the bigger power to actually, you know, go to a broadcaster and then come and, and say, okay, this is the, the show that I have, and I'm, you know, I'm able to bring that much audience to your platform. And, 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 and the sure power of yeah, exactly. So, so, just to add, I think for us, what it's done is that it's leveled the playing field, right? Because you know, no longer is it that the studio, the bigger studio, can produce uh, a better service. It can now. Uh, dominate the market, right? So now with data prices going down, it not, now grants the access to, to everyone, right? To have the choice to say, I can you know, log on to Showmax if I want to because it's actually relatively at, at the same price as this service and that service and that service. And at the same time, it's also given the producers more power in terms of creating more content, right? Because technology is not just about producing the, the service, that the platform that people watch, but it's also the, the equipment the, that the producers have to, you know, the, the produce the, the, the stories with, you know what I mean? I, I, I remember back in the days, a camera costing well over like a million rands that now costs like 250,000 rands, right? So now it's actually created access not only for the people watching the content, but also the people who want to get into the industry. So, so I think just to touch on challenges, uh, I think, I think the, the, no, no, absolutely, there's, there's definitely are challenges that come with such great diversity. Yeah. Um, I, think, I, think, I think the one piece for me is measurement. Um, and kind of, you know, one, one of my hats I wear, I also chair the, the broadcast research council. So I know that from, from, a, from a BRC perspective, is we're trying to create a, a singular currency, a digital currency that is monetizable, monetizable. Um, and I think that's an area that is not clearly defined, you know, uh, every platform is kind of, kind of has its own um, measurement tool or uh, video views or engagement or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, I think that's a challenge from a business perspective of how we then can monetize content, you know. Um, you know, all our brands, Media MTV, Comedy Central, you know, we, we are BT, Nick, uh, and the Nick, the, the Nick family brands, kids brands. We monetize across multiple platforms. But there's kind of a gray area in terms of just the commercial side of it. And, and, and I think we're getting closer to that uh, from a research perspective. But on the content, I think from South African perspective, we're lucky we have a currency that's Alive, you know, whether it's tapped or you know, but in the rest of the continent, it's still very, very in a gray area, um, which, which I think is one of the biggest challenges we need to lock in, because once again, it relates to how we create, how we invest, how we play this multi-territory, multi-platform game, uh, and be able to. You can, you'll only create more when you make more. What about the perspective of the performer? given the recent strength in the US. I think we're going to be having a lot more people watching African content. <laughs> <laughs> America has been put on pause for a while, so it's, it's, it's an opportunity. I mean, that, that's the thing about business and life. Um, if one person is struggling and you have the capability to do what they can, you take that opportunity. And I think now is the time that a lot of African content is going to be spreading, um, and hopefully we can get bigger budgets, you can get bigger partnerships, um, and more things can come out of it. I understand what the Americans are fighting for. It's going to benefit us eventually. Um, so let's push our stuff while we can. Yeah. I think for me, look, with every, you know, innovation, there's a good and a bad side to it, right? So I, I'm just talking about from a technology point of view. And I understand the strike that's happening, but for me, the thing is, and I see YouTube is now experimenting with AI dubbing, right? And obviously, that's also going to 
have a lot of pushback from you know the, the dubbing artists because this is great, it is going to be seen as a threat. But at the same time, there also is an opportunity there, in, right? I mean, if you just look at, for instance, how the tele telephone is, it has been innovated, right? Before that, people used to send letters, and then the telephone was, was introduced, and then we had telephone operators, operators, and then there was another disruption that happened with cell phones, which now meant we don't need telephone operators, right? But within that technology innovation, also came other innovations, which then gave opportunities to other people, right? So I think it's, got, it's short term, I think something that's going to be short lived, um, but at the same time, I think it will still also produce some kind of opportunity for everyone to still continue doing what they're doing. And at the same time, I'm coming back from a broadcaster's point of view, I think the biggest challenge for us is, is seeing how advertising revenue, we're trying to monetize that now on S1 platforms, right? We see now AVOD coming in, but at the same time, it's basically, basically us going back to the linear model, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because we started on, on linear with ads playing, and we took people from that, migrated them to an s platform and said, hey, no ads. And then now we say, actually, we want to give you ads. So, you know what I mean? So with every new innovation that comes, there also is an opportunity there. So how are you doing with the relations of intellectual property? So from, from our side, it's, it's, it's difficult to talk about intellectual property in the sense of a, a content owner or um, a rights owner of the IP. What we do from a technology service perspective is that we ensure uh, that when we deal with your content, that needs to be prepared, managed, localized, and eventually delivered to the likes of Joe Max, Paramount in this world, and so forth. We do that in a very secure manner. We take all the steps. You know, Blue was founded on security for the Gypsy. Uh, you know, we work with the likes of uh, Disney today. Even my daughter dubs for the likes of Disney today. Girl, she's not very happy, by the way, for the AI. Good story. <laughs> Thinks that, that the future's bleak, she's only 15. Uh, but every step of our supply chain, from a technology standpoint, is what we call TPN certified. So our job is to treat, as I said at the beginning, your content as an asset. We need to be that vault that ensures that when you're ready to expose your stories, it is exposed at exactly that time. And so from a service provider advocating and talking about affordability, what we just also want to have mixed into this conversation here is that it's your asset. And so we need to have that discussion here. It's not just about Africans have owning the rights, it's also how you manage your rights. Yeah. And so I just want to be that, uh, not that you know, annoying guy, but just a positive influence to have that discussion. And I would love, my name is Bobby Joa, it's blue, it's security, it's no. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's so what I've observed during this week. Uh, it's uh, it at least part of the conversation. I think absolutely. I think the conversation about IP is somebody who's obviously instructed Thing of having been a producer of content at times when IP, you know, the only way to get work is to be fully commissioned, and then the, that conversation is kind of moving along, we hope. But what I've noticed now that I'm kind of I've moved into sales and distribution is there's an opportunity for people to educate themselves about what IP means. I think we throw it around so much, and then the same people who are saying we're fighting for our IP are signing agreements that make no sense because they're not willing to get a lawyer to look at it, or they go and get the wrong kind of lawyer. We spend so much time explaining agreements to people, and I think there is an opportunity for everyone. Stop saying you want to own IP and actually understand what that means on the agreement level. Stop signing agreements that make no sense, and then you know you end up in a situation where you don't even you don't know what the rights are that you have over your own IP. And I think, please, guys, we have to conscientize ourselves and educate ourselves way more and stop throwing around IP. What does it mean? You know. Uh, yeah. I, I think when you when you create, I think whatever piece of content you need to think about. You need to think about windowing. You need to think about who am I creating for. You then need to think about the model. And the business model in today's world that going forward is, is, is very important. You know, there's different business models, different ways to skip this game and make a deal work. You now have multiple partners, you know. Um, um, you now have new platforms. You've got 
uh, escort, AVOD, free to air, which is from an African perspective, free to air has a long life. You know, they try to put us on the shelf, but if you take you live here, has a long life. You know, and and, 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 and and that's something we need to be mindful of. And and you know, I tell everyone who wants it's a great idea, and I'm like, okay, cool. Who are you creating it for? What and what's the business model for it? And once you once you once you start defining that, it's a good way of managing your IP. It's a good way of exploiting your IP. It's a good way of of also thinking about. You mentioned the writer strike. We we also have to create and think about the performer and the value chain when we create. And it's not something that uh, so on uh, next time. Uh, uh, you know, I think I think that's that's important. Yes. I think it, I think it really comes back to what um, Paolo said. Um, do your research. There's a lot of creatives out there that are so passionate. I want to make it like this. It needs to look like that. But they forget that once you've made the thing, it's a product. They're they're feeling like it's it's a it's a sculpture. But that sculpture needs to be sold. <laughs> you know. So find someone that knows about it and speak to them um, before you take it to. Distributors find someone that knows about IP and how to market a business plan. And it's a product. How am I going to sell it? So I want to touch briefly on certain areas that technology has impact. And, and briefly, in education and training, I read some research that says by 2030, over two billion jobs, as we know them today would have disappeared. So what are we doing in terms of education and training? Upskilling, mentorship, you know, in, in, in just different areas of your capacity. So, so fundamentally, fundamentally, I think the whole thing about education, just fundamentally in this industry, uh, we're, talk, we're talking about the future. It's, it's, I, I sense only, again, I don't have empirical evidence, but only this week, I really push uh, this. The, the African media industry is already very well aware that it needs to up qualify itself. And the bar has raised. So the questions we have had talking about sound design or subtitle organization, on one side, it is where are AI? The other one is, it's fine, Bobby, that you want to do this. But who is here on the ground helping us educate and so that this knowledge is not just transactional, but is shared so we can start asking the right questions going forward? I think that's very distinct. It's not something that I have, uh, that's not something I experienced, for instance, in LA. Um, so, Juliet down there, <laughs> my beautiful colleague, um, is operating out of Africa right now, and, and we just sense that this thing is, is already happening. That shipping. Then now, technology. Evaporate certain jobs. It's gonna happen. It's just gonna happen. Um, and so, even my daughter is not gonna necessarily do native dubbing <laughs> or human dubbing. But we are already today talking to British broadcasters, testing uh, the impact of synthetic voices in certain areas. Not you know, the originals of this world, but certain areas. The conclusion, however, right now is it's not ready for commercial use in any sense. But there could be, uh, if we talk about technological, logistical activities like dubbing or subtitling, it could be you know, a hybrid version. Uh, and so the technology is advanced to a certain extent, a certain type of content that allows you to push them to you know, platforms that has other types of budgets. Um, and then you have humans choosing and finalizing them in a different way. So I think we will see, we'll see you know, subtitles in this world, QCs, distributors, they will all exist in some sense, but they'll be in a different entity, in a different dressing. Technology will be embedded in every step. Um, when, when it comes to education, um, from my experience in Nigeria, the film industry doesn't have that many um, well-known schools, for example. Um, but over the past three to four years, a lot of um, smaller educational platforms have been sprouting up. Um, and in Nigeria specifically, when you enter the film industry, you usually are either coming in through someone that you know, or you want to do something and you need help. There's no rigid doc doctrine, or this is how to do it, or you need to go here to get this. 
you have to have this degree. Usually how it works in Nigeria is you have a skill, you try it out, this person sees you're good, you tell the next person. So Accelerate decided to start creating an, um, a training program called the Filmmaker Project, which has now grown into the Phoenix Project, where we have online training for free, um, and then it's paid for higher levels. So we think it, it's, it's, it's very important to find out what's important, how to get into these things. Many, many people think that you go to film school and then you're a filmmaker. That's the beginning. <laughs> if you don't know how to network, any filmmaker you meet, no matter if they're quiet, whether they're noisy, they know how to network or they have someone on their team that knows how to network. And those are vital things that you learn on the job. Um, and yeah, you need to find research to find out where to get that education. I think also policy. We need to think about you know, every broadcaster, industry, film institution, it differs globally you know, uh, or across the continent there's different challenges but I think I think where we need to make sure that we is is influence in a, in a policy level across you know the different institutions or across the different markets. Because if you get to, if you if you influence at a policy level, you know that I mean it's certainly regulate there's regulations in many countries for export, you know uh, as for players now, you know, the digital age has also meant that you have to now have specific regulatory compliance that you need to apply in different markets. It's going to come to Africa. It's, it's already been applied in different parts of, of the world. And for me, it's in the you have to influence policy and legislation. And, and legislation to, in order to then prioritize um, um, trade and development. The digital age is also challenging. You know, because you know, streaming comes with new technology. It's coming with you know. So whilst yes, there will be jobs that might change and shift, or essentially of loss, there will be more new skills created yeah. to create more jobs. So it, you know, it it, it it will work kind of this way that way. But I think I think from a trading development perspective, it is policy. We need to align with the right platforms, institutions. To align policy, then there's kind of a stand. Right now, it's that difficult. Everyone does the whole thing. Yeah. But if anyone wanted to say something, I just wanted to say that what I'm, what I've seen in in, uh, in FICO from um, West Africa, mm-hmm. specifically in Senegal, is that in terms of education, the fact that you know people have access to the internet has been really great. You know, and just for like somebody who's who's, who's uh, starting up, it's, it's a great resource. You know, in terms of like. Like a wealth of information that wasn't available before. I mean, like the school of YouTube. Yeah, the school of YouTube, yeah, definitely. And then also, like in terms of, uh, you know, as we've seen also because we've had like, a, you know, like a, um, a lot of uh, filmmakers from uh, of uh, like Francophone countries who've had like, you know, done films in, in uh, that went to Hong uh, Kong or whatever, like a Mati or anything like that. Like they're actually, you know, coming back and creating scripts. So there's like also like a, you know a, there are entities that are that, that are giving like a more like structured uh, education in terms of uh, you know of, of filmmaking and all that. So I'm very optimistic in terms of, like, of where uh, this is going because people have the opportunity to uh, uh, not only you know, get the, the practical uh, training but also uh, I guess the more theoretical. theoretical so we're running out of time. Just, just going back a little bit on the narrative of African storytelling. Do you think that African stories serve as cultural diplomacy, you know, within the continent and around the globe? As you know, it's an interesting question you ask. I was having a chat with friends about the whole Marvel. Um, Black Panther thing, which was like, you know, Disney and not to us about possible African mythology, which a lot of it was questionable, right? Um, not that it was necessary, but that happened. But I think the question you're asking is so important because if we don't start to do exactly what you're saying, the US is going to do it, bigger mouths is going to do it. The opportunity is like, it's not even just like optional at this point because 
Wakanda forever and all of that has shown what happens when we don't. So I think I just wanted to throw that in there because it was such a strange conversation about <laughs> we're watching it and is it supposed to be ours or not? Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. And this, I think another great example is uh, you look at TV base, the number one is the music of culture channel on the continent. Why? Um, I think we've been at the forefront of music culture. We've been at the forefront of if you look now, where's Afrobeat? Afrobeat is the you know, but someone had to tell the story. Someone had to create a platform to elevate it early enough, create the pop culture. Um, if you look at Amapiana now, Amapiana is the next wave, you know, um, you know guys like Musa Keys, like DJs are at the VMA is performing, you know, like it's just amazing how we see that form of content, that form of storytelling really take on its own and, and I think, you know, visual contents, films, etc. need to start moving in that direction at the back of this amazing attention we are getting from the world. You know, and, and, and I think that's a great opportunity that comes with these multiple platforms because we also are either commissioning, partnering, co-producing for multinationals now, cross-border content. So also this collaborative piece, you know, like you know, I see a lot of filmmakers now in Nigeria, I work with South African filmmakers, we've got some we've got some BT uh, uh, you know titles coming from BT plus in the US that are shot, you know, just here in Durban, they go they go some part of the content. So it's important to do that cross pollination here because then that's our USP. No one can do it. We need to learn to do it to the Stop thinking about I really like together. No, we should stop doing it. Let's do it together. You know, because we all want to do it to everyone's got a brand. No guys, you know, brands connect, brands collaborate because now you can also now start doing those ambitious Wakandas. Those ambitious projects that yeah. big money. And if you're going to do that, we're going to need to do it together. And, and we started to do those kind of partnerships, see those kind of partnerships across, you know, free to air, as well, etc. So we, we, we all just have to work together across the continent um, to make the magic work for us. You have and, and work with partners with the commercial. Sure, but you have a gazillion stories, really. I mean, in that context, uh, came from one of my yeah. colleagues who said, they should uh, be doing those I mean, You know, we just don't shut up. You know, mm. where's Mushesh? You know, you know, like, there's, a, there's so much more. There's so much more to tell, and 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 let's 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 play on what, obviously, what the market and what the consumers want. You know, epic epic titles are now back. You know, you saw Vikings kind of brought back a, you know, Game of Thrones. Guess what? I mean, what are we doing from an African perspective to, to play an epic? But still, they need us to work together. Look, I think we are on the right path, right, in terms of trying to tell those African stories. But for me, it's not just really about trying to tell African stories, because you can do it anyhow, right? But it's always about trying to affect it. Because if you miss that piece, then you've missed it all, right? I mean, anybody can produce the shot, right? Depending on the scale they wanted to produce it on. But that missing thing for us is trying to do it the right way, so that we protect the legacy of that story, right? Um, and I just also just wanted to say, just go back to the situation thing. For us, the multi choice, we're very intentional about this, right? So, we also have the multi choice talent factory, just from an educational point of view, and also that incubator into the, into the industry. So, any under, undergraduates uh, who have just come out of film school, from an education point of view, we can take them on into that program and learn all the different disciplines of the, of the, of the, of the industry. And, and, and this is our way of, of really trying to protect the industry itself and trying to get back. Yeah. I just want to conclude uh, with a few questions. Um, so overall, the impact of technology on African cinema and television has been transformative, enabling creators to reach wider audiences, experiment with new storytelling techniques, and contribute to the global cultural conversation. Right. Um, are we shaping the future of the film and TV in Africa? Or are we already in the future? Just concluding remarks. I think you, it's very subjective, and it's been in the 
maturest way only. It has only just begun. It has only just begun. What I've seen here is um, it's just fascinating. I said in the beginning that I was involved. It was not just about the city. It was about the people, the energy, the dynamics, the innovation, the creativity, the self-awareness of where you are. It's not where you are, but where you want to go. Um, and the discussion we've had in between, we talked about you know, storytelling, based on this thing, but it's also about in that we just do boring chain. There's a thing called money. It costs something, right? You need to do something. And yet, you know, part of that distinctness disappears if you don't pay attention to quality. So we, in, 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 in Africa, we talk a lot about dubbing uh, to localize. And I just see that being, being casually thrown around this discussion. But things are changing. The discussion changes. So I think, um, I would like to say we, we have just done that. But we will continue to learn, right? So, and for me, that's where the potential lies, right? In the, in the learning opportunity. Um, so, we definitely haven't shaped it. Uh, I think there's so much more to go. I think even with all, all the competitors that came in African landscape, they came in and then they realized that actually this is not how it is and how it operates in the rest of the world. So, they had to rethink their business model and it had to be more uh, cautious in how they invest because you can't just throw money at it and think it's going to fix itself, right? Um, so, so we are together in this journey, right? And, and, and for me, the idea is really trying to grow the industry. That, that, that for me is, is my wish. And, and uh, if so, I don't see competition. I see collaboration, as Moni said. I see, I, see, I see great partners because we're all trying to solve the same problem, right? So just to exist. Um, the way I see is uh if you think about it from the perspective of an artist, your piece of artwork is never done. You just stop working on it. <laughs> so that's the same way that the industry is. It's going to keep growing. When we get to a point that we think we know what we're doing, we're good, there's going to be a new innovation that's going to change everything. I mean, just the other day, someone was telling me about um, augmented reality, which can create sets. So, <laughs> like, seriously, he was, he was talking about how the, you stand there and Somebody goes with a 3D camera to the location, records it, and then and then puts you in it. That's a whole new field that didn't exist. Exactly. So, so it, 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 it's, it's never going to end. And I think that, like everyone's saying, if we work together, we can get it to where we need it to be. Um, so I think we're probably, let's just keep working together and taking it all the way. Uh, I agree absolutely. I think we're Africa is just getting started. I think we haven't even seen what we can do. I think when I think about in terms of uh, you know just the fact that we are the youngest uh, continent, that, that, that really is I think it is amazing. I mean, I know in terms of like dreams, in terms of imagination, in terms of we are very open, we're very uh, uh, turned towards the world. We have like the you know the, um, the ability to actually absorb. Uh, stuff from the world and then make it our own. I think it's it's really amazing, and I and I think also that you know all the the, the divide and the, the working together is definitely going to come. I have to be. I just want to add one thing, and that is to show the previous series, and I don't think we've covered. I think one of the ways that we can try to support the younger people as they come up is to hand over skills and really make it intentional. And I think. It's got to be each one, teach one at least at the level that we are at, because if we're not doing that, then we're really just not helping the whole, the whole process at all. So I think that was quite an important point to raise in terms of how do we affect, how do we um, deal with how big things are, how, how much they're changing, how do we make people prepared for it who are younger in the industry. And we hope that our years of experience can do that for them. That's quite important. Um, no, absolutely. I think I think our industry is transitioning. We are growing. We are developing. We're on the right path. Um, I think we're a lot more intentional um, on where we are going. Um, I mean, I know at Paramount, you know, just globally, we are living it every single day. You know, we are. We are. You know, we, we have multiple platforms. Multiple. You know, whether it's streaming, whether it's linear uh, studio business, we are great. You know, and, and, and really we're living it and there's best practice that we're also applying from an African uh, perspective. You know, I get myself uh, you know, we lead this business and, and, and be very intentional about applying best practice. 
and that's what we need to do more of. There's a lot of information, there's a lot of knowledge. Let's just bring it home and we miss that. That's where the development and, 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 and educational pieces start coming. But you know, you know, we're fortunate because we're in, a, we're in a place where a lot of our colleagues around the world have launched Sweden, have launched SVAR, have launched AVON, etc., etc., uh, fast services, and we are now applying it. We are applying this practice uh, and really modeling how partnerships are done. And, and I think that's 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 what excites me. I think the future is bright. Does that mean doing away with formats so that we hear new voices? Or? Hear me no formats. We definitely look. The format is, formats will always be there, right? I think it's one of those things. I mean, we try to produce our own formats. Um, I mean, if you look at what your idols have done, you look at what your real housewives have done, formats is the reason why they're successful. And we, we learn from them too, right? Um, you can't just go out and say, I want to create my own format and think you've got the recipe to do it. <laughs> it's the reason why real housewives works, right? And we're learning from those things and hopefully in the future we'll be creating our own. I just want to give an opportunity to three questions. We're running out of time. Two. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Chief Mende. I'm an actress, director, voice of from Zimbabwe. I moved to South Africa 16 years ago to study and to work in the industry. So, we have the diaspora because members of our family or African people have moved for access, right? Uh, we think of it was Alma's grandparents or parents moved to the UK, Boris Kujo's parents. A lot of us come from multicultural families. My question is, when we look at what the African industry is, it looks to a lot of us in terms of stories, West Africa and the Sadic region, specifically Nigeria, Ghana, and South Africa. My question is specifically to the streaming platforms. What are we doing to make it paramount uh, to showcase and accelerate <laughs> the extraction of stories from other regions so that the African industry is showcasing spaces that where the industry is not as developed. Nigeria and South Africa, which by the way just holds a blue ocean. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so my question is, what is it that we're doing to, this comes from having had a conversation with other streaming platforms, and they said, well, the numbers are just not enough in those territories. But it's, it, it, I've come from that space, I studied in those spaces, I learned to be an actor in those spaces, but in order to work, I had to move. But how can we create more, you spoke about training, how can we make the, those industries, those developing spaces, have access to be strength? Okay, can I take another question so that you address it? Um, we, oh, okay. Out of time. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so the last Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kelly Makabane. I'm a filmmaker, a writer, a producer, director, and I'm also the chairperson of the Documentary Filmmakers Association. My question is around the fallacy of African content with a global audience. So when we hear streamers talking to us and we attend platforms like this, our content is always uh, there's an unfair ask on African filmmakers to make African content with a global appeal because if it's too local, the rest of the world will not be able to relate. However, if you look at in the entire history of Hollywood, an American filmmaker, no American filmmaker has ever made any film so that an African can relate. They are making Films for American and American life with universal themes that we can relate to. So it goes back to what people are saying and how much we believe in our work. So I, I we not the very people, or I do not the very people, creating that undermining in our own film 
but by wanting us to have a sense of assimilation, you know, because you look at the Kardashians, they've become a global phenomenon. Other than that, that's not the Kardashians of Africa, other, um, what are they called, Uzwai and all of those guys, the Bala family. What makes them different to the Kardashians is how you sell them, how much you believe in them. So why are African filmmakers always requested to make African content with a global appeal? Is our appeal not our authenticity in the most real way as opposed to diluting and assimilating to the world as if we are not good enough as we are? Back to square one. <laughs> Alright, so I'll take the first one. Alright. Um, and I just like to dispel that, uh, that fallacy around uh, there's uh, broadcasters who will tell you that no, you can't produce a television show in this region because there aren't people there, etc., etc., right? So for our business, uh, the research actually tells us something else, right? So what we've discovered in the past is that many broadcasters, what they would do is take a show from South Africa and think this is a great show, let me dab it and give it to uh, and show it to people in Tanzania and hope that they're going to watch it. And then the research comes back and no one's watching it. Why? Because the con content that you're taking there is not relatable with the people who live there. So what we've done is that we've now started to invest in the industry in Tanzania or the industry in Nigeria so that the filmmakers in those regions can tell stories about the people in those regions. And the numbers don't lie, which is the reason we see our channels like Maisha Magic Bongo or uh, our channels in Nigeria doing so well in those regions because people are, are watching content that actually speaks to them. And this, this is the same ap approach that we've taken to Esport. So now our Esport platform, um, and by the way, we are creating a kick-ass new platform, which is Watch the Space, um, is going to now have much more content and also content that is representative of the whole African continent. Right, so this means that if you're someone from Ethiopia, you're going to have content that is made by Ethiopians that relates to you, and well, then obviously for those who want to watch it in another language, you're then able to do that. You might not, not relate, but at least we know we have service a different market, and not just catering for Nigeria and South Africa, as you've pointed out. Okay. I beg your pardon. Okay. Directly, not a problem. Someone else wants to take the question? I mean, it's, it's a similar, similar thing. Like, from, from the accelerating perspective, that's why we exist. Um, we have a percentage, because we live in Nigeria, we have 40% Nigerian content, and the remaining 60% is split across the whole of Africa. Right now on the platform, we have content from South Africa, Uganda, uh, Kenya, the, the, the split. And coming here, we meet more people. So yeah, send us your stuff. <laughs> that, that's why we exist so that people in, people around the world can see what it's like in Africa and Africa is how so much go to get their own content. I think I just want to say that I have been moved when that conversation was happening just like you're saying, I want to validate you. People are saying, oh no, there's no market in Zambia for this that and the other. And it's such a difficult conversation to have, but I've got a wonderful example about a movie that's just come out of Netflix and you see it's distributed by Triple A distribution, which is a small Zambian film that is that so wonderful, right? On Netflix. So next time that conversation comes up, I'm gonna say no guys, because we did this with Can You See Us, who said it was a small Zambian film that was not going to do well and it did. So I think those beautiful little poignant movies we're now seeing coming out of small, they're calling them small markets, are going to we're going to get to the point where we make critical mass of those, and that argument do not apply in one there are 10 folks that did well on Netflix that were from Zimbabwe. So I think I validate you. I don't think it's the right way to go, but I want you to know that I've heard those conversations. But so many beautiful programs are managing obscure regions. They are doing it. So if, if you look at time frame, yeah. 10 years ago, we had no access. If you wanted to watch an Hollywood movie, you had to ask a friend to send it over on a DVD. Time has changed. The access has come. So the problems that you're facing now are going to be nothing very soon. That's <laughs> so, uh, I, I mean, I was just going to try and answer both questions at the same time. Um, I think for me, it's important to define, define the 
find the product, find the market that you're creating it for. I think it kind of starts there. You know, that then, 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 then dictates to platforms, broadcasters, investors, how you're going to make it work. Unfortunately, that's, that's, the, that's the name of the game. You know, if, if, if we, you know, we get a lot of people who create content, they come to me and say, it's that, it's not, put it on air. Is this going to rate? How is it going to rate? How, okay, you want me to invest in it, but how do I recruit? You know, unfortunately, that's, you know, I don't have, like, lie and say that's not what it is. That's what it is. We have to define the product, then define for what market are we creating it for, and then we specifically then execute with a plan and a model in mind to allow all of us to win. You, 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 all of us who are in the thing, uh, chain to win. And I think it's, it, it, it applies to your question. It's, the same, it's almost the same thing, you know, uh, where, where you have you have a lot of you have, right now you have a lot of African American producers. Um, you know, a, a few months ago, Asanya had a couple of people doing a tour with film commissions. They went down the wine route. They went down to Durban, looking at locations. Then everyone wants to come, you know, back to the future. They want to come to Africa. We've got the best landscapes. We've got the ocean. We've got we've got the we've got the city. They they come in here. Marvel was the top cruise was here. Like, they're all here. They're all here. They they because they get the benefit of you know great cruise, amazing cruise. We execute at the top level, and obviously the red dollars fantastic. We get all value for that investment. Yeah. experience <laughs> and and you get the great weather the great sun you make and we you know, great food and we make great friends you know the the beauty about the beauty about these conversations and yes they are important but once again let's think about what's the product define the product and for what market are you are you, are you producing it just for South Africa because we're also producing a lot of a very essay centric you know or is it or is it for multiple markets, you know, you want is it Pan African? So you then do a Pan African product. Product. Who are you going to sell it for, or sell it to, in terms of uh, commercializing the investment? Uh, what platforms? What are those fees? You know, so they do it upfront because that will then change the game. And we're getting better at at planning and and, 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 and planning our business models. We're getting better and better at that. And let me tell you, in another five odd years it will be the it will be the other way around. Like I said, look away Afrobeat is. They can they, they they shutting down the O2, they're breaking it up. Okay? Now while we when are we gonna produce our own Wakanda that's gonna shut down the world from from here. We have but we have to get define the product, define the market. And if you go in the broad market, it does lead you to then take a different model in how you then make it a more cross-border global product that you're creating, but we, we don't do enough of that. We don't create. We don't. We're not intentional about creating products for a global market, and that's why we get stuck in this. It's a twang. It's a twang. No, you know, or we get stuck in this global thought. We can go on forever. I hope you've been answered. Thank you very much to my panel. <laughs> um, so the next chapter for film and TV in Africa. We have to start it. Thank you. Thank you.